Hello, and welcome from me, Alexander Bird, and the Philosophy and Medicine Project at King's College London, funded by the Peter Sowerby Foundation. This video podcast is a supplement to our Layperson's Guide to Epidemiological Modelling, and it concerns herd immunity. We did touch on herd immunity in the previous video, but I'd like to add some further detail and also correct an oversimplification that revealed itself when I did some modelling of my own. Herd immunity has been mentioned a lot lately. It has been alleged that herd immunity was the aim of the British government's COVID-19 strategy early on, promoted by the Prime Minister's advisor, Dominic Cummings. If so, Mr Cummings has been doing his bit for herd immunity by catching the disease himself. Uh, we wish Mr Cummings a safe recovery, as we do all those suffering from this nasty and dangerous disease. I don't think that aiming at herd immunity was ever the government's official policy. The official view seems to have been that some degree of herd immunity is a helpful byproduct of the government's strategy, not its aim per se. Still, the government's chief scientist, or chief scientific advisor, Sir Patrick Vallance, did talk up herd immunity to some extent in an interview he did for ITV, which it must be said covered many other things besides. And this is what he said. When you look at infections across whole communities, when you get up to about 60% of people who've had it, you get something called herd immunity, which means we're then all a bit protected from it. So that's if it does get to that level, that provides quite a lot of protection going forward, as this may become an annual event like seasonal flu. Let's first uh, remind ourselves what herd immunity is. Well, the basic idea is fairly straightforward. It's the idea that if there are a large number, a large proportion of the population who are immune from a disease, for example, by having been vaccinated against it, then it makes it that much less likely that an infective person will come into contact with and infect a susceptible. Or a little bit more precisely, it becomes yeah, unlikely that they will do so before they themselves have recovered from the disease and are no longer infectious. Let's look at this in a little bit more. Uh, detail. Remember that we introduced this idea of beta, uh, that being a measure of how infectious a disease is in a particular social context, you know, for a particular community, a particular population. So beta just really means the number of new infections produced by an existing infective person each day. If someone is infectious, how many new infections do they bring about per day? Okay, so let's work with this example where beta is two thirds. So the infective person in the middle has uh, passed on their infection to, as it were, two thirds of a person. What that means is, on average, the number of people infected by our infective per day is two-thirds, not that they've infected your two arms and the leg, say. Okay, so let's see how this, this works out. Imagine that this disease is typically infectious for two days. So we'll consider two days, and on the beginning of the first day, our infective has just become infected, just become infectious, capable of passing on the disease. By the end of that day, they've infected, as it were, two-thirds of a person. By the end of the next day, they've infected another two-thirds of a person. So that's one and a third people in total. But by the end of that day, they've also themselves come to the end of their illness. They have now they've recovered, and they are now uh, immune, hence the turning from red into to green. So at the beginning of this period, there was just one infectious person. But at the end of this period, there's one of the third infectious people. So this disease is, is growing. 
over time, uh, every two days, there will be an increase of a third in the number of people who are infectious. Okay, so for this disease, um, beta times D, the duration of the disease, is one and two thirds. Uh, beta times D, perhaps better known as R naught, the basic reproduction number that people talk about. And because it's greater than one, this is a disease that will spread. This is an epidemic that will grow. Let's now imagine we're at a stage when quite a lot of people are immune, perhaps from vaccination or perhaps from having got the disease. That does make a difference, as we'll see later on, but for the moment, it could be either. So now, although our infective person meets eight people, as he did before, four of them are immune. As we saw a moment ago, when our infective was meeting eight susceptible people, he ended up infecting two-thirds of a person on average. But now he is meeting only four susceptible people, the other four people he meets being immune. So you can see that on average now, he'll end up infecting only one third of a person. When we look at how things go for the two day period of our infectives, infectiousness, he starts at the beginning of the day infected, nobody else is. At the end of the first day, end of the first 24 hours, one third of a person is infected. And at the end of the second day, another third of a person is infected. So in total, two thirds of a person has been infected over the two day period. And at the end of that period, he himself has gone from being infective to immune. Okay, so at the beginning of the period, there was one infected person. And at the end of the period, there's two thirds of an infected person. So we can see that overall, as time goes by, there is a reduction in the number of infected individuals. And so this disease is on its way to dying out. So we can look at this a little bit more mathematically. We can say that an epidemic will be on the way. The number of infectives will be reducing when S divided by N times the basic reproduction number is less than one. S is the number of susceptibles, N is the total population. So S over N is the proportion of the population that is still susceptible. That multiplied by the basic reproduction, if it's less than one, that's when the epidemic will start to subside. So we can think that there's a turning point when S over N times R naught is equal to one. This is the threshold for waning, the point at which the epidemic will be subsiding. This is also the threshold for herd immunity. So that if S over N, the proportion of the population that is susceptible, is sufficiently low, thanks to vaccination, that S over N times R naught is equal to one, then we have reached herd immunity. That is to say, that if the disease is introduced into this population, then that disease won't spread, it will die out pretty much straight away. We saw last time that we can rewrite all this mathematics so that we end up with this rule here, a sort of threshold rule for herd immunity, that the proportion of the population that is immune has got to be greater than R0 minus one over R naught, or if you prefer, one minus one over R naught. So let's now look at a graph that depicts how an epidemic might develop over time. This is, remember, the SIR model, the susceptibles, infectives, and recoveds model. So we're interested in these three groups or compartments and how their numbers change over time. So this is a typical epidemic. You'll see that the number of infectives increases, reaches a maximum, and then decreases 
in a kind of slightly skewed bell curve. Now let's look at this threshold for herd immunity. Remember that that was equal to R0 minus 1 over R0. So let's imagine that a disease of interest has a R0 basic reproduction number of 3.5. Therefore, the herd immunity threshold for this disease is 3.5 minus 1 over 3.5. And when you do the maths, it turns out that that's 71.4%. That means that the number who are immune thanks to vaccination or whatever has to be over 71.4%. Correspondingly, the number of those who are susceptible has to be below 28.6%. So imagine that we have vaccinated this population up to that level, 71.4%, or perhaps a little bit more. And then we see what happens if we introduce a small number of infectives into this population. Well, we see that really nothing happens at all. That infection doesn't catch on. The few infectives recover. They don't infect many new people. The number of uh, susceptibles doesn't really change. Uh, and neither, therefore, does the number who are in the category of vaccinated and recovered. But let's see what happens if we haven't quite vaccinated our population to the herd immunity threshold. So we've succeeded in vaccinating 60% of the population. And we can see here that when we introduce a small number of infectives into that population, that number will gradually increase, and therefore the number of susceptibles decreases over time. This disease has caught on. It is growing. There is an epidemic, albeit a slow-burning one. Let's reduce the vaccination rate even lower to 40%, well below the threshold of 71.4%. Then, if we introduce some infectives, we get a clear epidemic on our hands. Note that in this case, we started with 40% of the population being vaccinated, but by the end of the epidemic, the total proportion of those who have been either vaccinated or have got the disease and have recovered is much higher, it's over 80%. The difference between that 80% and the 40% is that portion of the population that has been infected thanks to this outbreak. It's interesting to note that by the time the disease has died out, the proportion of the population that is either vaccinated or has got the disease and has recovered, and therefore is immune that way, is well over the herd immunity threshold. It is not the case that the disease stops once the immune, herd immunity threshold is, is reached. On the contrary, it keeps going and more people get infected and have to recover from the disease. If we reduce the vaccination rate even further to 20%, that effect becomes even clearer. Eventually this disease dies out, but by the time it does, the number of immunes is very high, well over the threshold for immunity. And likewise, the proportion of the population that is susceptible is well below that required for herd immunity. Let's take the extreme case where there are no vaccinations at all, an infection is introduced into the community and catches on in an epidemic. In that case, the number who get the disease and eventually recover reaches 97%, well over the herd immunity threshold of 71.4%. So there is an important lesson to be learned from this. If an outbreak starts with immunity well below the herd immunity threshold, then it will only end when the proportion of immunes, that's to say the vaccinated plus the recovered, is significantly above the herd immunity threshold. And in particular, in the case where no one is vaccinated, you will end up with 
many more people being infected by the disease than you would have had to vaccinate to get herd immunity. So why is there this difference between what happens when you achieve herd immunity by vaccination and what happens when a disease is introduced into a population where no one has been vaccinated and it grows into an epidemic that eventually burns itself out? Why is it that there are so many more people who get the disease in the second case than need to be vaccinated in the first case. So let's have another look at these graphs. So let's take this case where 40% of the population has been vaccinated. I'm going to introduce a fourth line now, which is as well, all those who are immune in the sense of they can't get the disease, either because they vaccinated or recovered, or because they are currently infectious. So that gives us this brown line. Note that the brown line crosses the herd immunity threshold on exactly the day that the number of infectives is at its maximum, which is also the point at which the proportion of susceptibles drops below its corresponding threshold. We can see that again in this case. Indeed, it will always be the case. We can see here that the brown line, the total of immunes, the green line and the red line added together, that is, that line crosses the herd immunity threshold at exactly the point when the proportion of infectives is at its maximum. Why is that? Well, that's for a simple reason that this rule for herd immunity is also the threshold for waning. That is to say, it is the point at which the number of infectives begins to decrease. And as you see, it is indeed decreasing at this point. Nonetheless, there are still a large number of infectives in the population. And of course, these will eventually themselves recover, adding therefore to the green and brown lines. Furthermore, they will themselves go on to infect some extra people, fewer each time, that is true. But if we're starting off with a large number of infectives, it will still be the case that the infection will continue in the population for some time. And all those people who are newly infected will have to add to the green and brown lines, taking it well beyond the herd immunity threshold line. This effect, the effect of there being a large number of infectives around when the waning threshold is reached, isn't relevant for the case of herd immunity because there just aren't a large number of infectives in that case. But it is going to be important in the middle of an epidemic when nobody has been vaccinated. So this is the important lesson to be learned, that during an epidemic, the herd immunity threshold is the point at which the number of infectives is at a maximum and will start to decline. It's therefore not the end of the epidemic, but its waning point, the beginning of the end. But because there are still many infectives, there will be many further infections before the epidemic ends. So let's talk about how this all plays out with respect to COVID-19. So COVID-19 has an R0, a basic reproduction number of 2.5. So the herd immunity threshold is 2.5 minus 1 over 2.5, which is neatly 60%. You'll remember that Sir Patrick Vallance mentioned 60% in his interview. However, that doesn't mean that if COVID-19 infects an unprotected population, then 60% of the population will get infected and then the epidemic stops. On the contrary, as we can see in this graph, of what happens, the epidemic will die out only once the number of those who have been infected is over 90% of the population. So Patrick Vallance mentioned the figure of 60% as a relevant herd immunity figure. Now, I don't know quite what he was referring to or on what basis he said this. So it might be that his 60% isn't the same thing as the 60% herd immunity threshold that I've been talking about. Nonetheless, it is clear that if a population were to suffer a COVID-19 epidemic without protection, 
then the disease would infect over 90% of the population before it died out, not merely 60%. And that, of course, has serious implications for the numbers of people who might die as a result of this infection. What we need to ask about at this point is something called the infection fatality rate. That is to say, the proportion of people who die of those who get infected. It's a different number from something else that you might have come across, which is the case fatality rate. The case fatality rate is the proportion of those who are reported cases of the disease who die. That's going to be greater than the infection fatality rate because some of those infected will not show up as full-on cases. They may either be asymptomatic or they may have only mild symptoms and so not get reported. Because COVID-19 is quite new, there is some disagreement amongst the experts as to what the numbers are for either of these statistics. The World Health Organization suggests that the case fatality rate is somewhere between 3 and 4%. A paper in Eurosurveillance, a European journal for infectious disease, takes the case fatality rate to be a bit lower, 2.6% and estimates the infection fatality rate to be 1.3%. Paper in the British Medical Journal thinks that the case fatality rate is 1.38%, and the infection fatality rate is 0.66%. Let's work with the most optimistic of the infection fatality rates. The infection fatality rate is the one that we're interested in, because we're going to be looking at all those who get infected in the course of an epidemic and want to know how many of those will die. We're dealing with the UK population that has 67 million. If we are thinking of the figure of 60%, which is in fact the figure that I used in my earlier video, then that's 40 million people, and with an infection fatality rate of 0.66%, then that would lead to 265,000 deaths. Whereas, as I've said, we would expect, in fact, 90% of the population to become infected, which is 60 million people, which would lead to almost 400,000 deaths with the same infection fatality rate. Of course, that might be an overestimate insofar as we would take special measures to make sure that it was the most vulnerable, the most likely to die, who are least likely to be infected. On the other hand, we are using the most conservative, the most optimistic infection fatality rate. If, in fact, the infection fatality rate is higher, as other reports have suggested, then, of course, the number of deaths will be that much greater. For this reason, I don't think that it could ever have been reasonable to pursue herd immunity without significant additional protective measures of the kind that we're currently experiencing. On the other hand, a vaccine is not expected to be available for many months. Consequently, we must expect a relaxation of the lockdown to lead to additional infections. To avoid an epidemic leading to deaths on the scale I've mentioned, we'll need to aim to reduce the infection fatality rate as far as possible. And that will be achieved by ensuring that the elderly and most vulnerable are the least likely to be infected, and that the NHS has enough capacity to give the serious cases the best care possible. I'll come back to this in days to come. Thank you for watching, and for more content like this, please visit philosophyandmedicine.org.